and no wonder he wanted her to destroy these letters. But these letters exist, and so tell her at least two persons. One for the public, this self-assured, aggressive person, and the other person was this doubtful, self-tormenting, weak, hesitant, always looking for the authority for approval. Welcome to My Nuclear Life. I'm Shelley Lesher. If you have listened to even a few episodes of this podcast, you know that I bring up Edward Teller a lot. He kind of lurks in the background. So I figured it was time to kind of hit this one head on and ask someone to come on this podcast and talk to me about him. So I've invited Istvan Hargitay, a physical chemist and professor emeritorius at the Budapest University of Technology and Economics to speak to me about this. He has written many interesting books, including one called Judging Edward Teller, which is obviously the topic of this podcast. Just a little behind the scenes in podcasting, I do my research before the episode and and I write down a bunch of questions that I want to talk to my guest about. And this was no different. I mean, as you can imagine, I had a million questions about Teller. In the end, I didn't really ask any of them because Isvan made me see Teller as an actual person, not just the Bond villain that I had in my head. And for some reason, those very specific questions didn't really seem important anymore. They really seemed to answer themselves. Tell me what you think. So I've been reading your book on Teller. And I will say I am very surprised because the image I had of Teller in my head was not reflected in what I read about Teller. I guess I saw him as, in his later years, I saw him as the Livermore director who just wanted to use his hydrogen bomb to kind of destroy the world. But that is definitely not not the image. This is already a mistaken notion. The one who advocated using nuclear bombing was von Neumann. After the war, he made a statement that there should be a preemptive strike, nuclear strike on Moscow. If you tell me tomorrow, I tell you it should be today. If you tell me in the afternoon, I would tell you why not in the morning or something like that. I'm paraphrasing because I, I don't remember word by word. But this is a kind of teller, on the other hand, he always emphasized defense. If you read through my book, you will see I'm not biased for Teller, but I am very biased for at least trying to be objective. He, true, he was not only an experimental scientist, a theoretical scientist, he was also a political scientist. His consideration was more protecting the United States and protecting the free world from the Soviet Union rather than preemptively bombarding the Soviet Union. So that's surprising because I've never heard of that side of of Van Neumann, the side of saying, let's attack the Soviet Union, let's, you know, kind of destroy them. Not necessarily destroy the Soviet Union, but definitely bomb Moscow so that Moscow could not initiate war or follow up with its imperialistic intentions and so on. I don't think they wanted to destroy the Soviet Union as such. In a way, I'm not surprised by what you are saying, because Teller polarized people very much so. He was a very poor politician. Von Neumann was a much better politician because he didn't argue for his views. He stayed more in the background. Of the five Martians, von Karman was similarly more staying in the background, giving advice, and so was Wigner. Leo Szilard and Edward Teller were the ones who who like put themselves out into the front line and represent their views strongly and vocally and visibly. So we mentioned the Martians. Who are the Martians? Why were they called Martians? My definition for the Martians of science is five brilliant scientists 
who were willing to risk their scientific careers in order to devote themselves to the defense of the United States and the free world during the Second World War and during the Cold War. Now, this is my definition, and it was also Edward Teller's definition in his memoirs. Some other people, including one of the late leading science historian, physicist, who said that the Martians were the people who emigrated to the West and made Hungary famous in the West. This is diluting the definition of the Martian, because I should add also that all five of them came from upper middle class Jewish families in Budapest. And there was a tendency and there has been a tendency to downplay the Jewishness of of these people or anybody who becomes famous and very successful. So they concocted this general idea that the Martians are these famous Hungarians in the West who were curious to go to the West to find out and became successful. But they weren't just curious. They gave up their careers to come to the U.S. No, they didn't give up their careers, but they risked their careers. And they went to the West not just because they were curious. They were persecuted. There was Hungary was very anti-Semitic. There were anti-Jewish laws. So they felt they had to leave. This should not be masked. Now, you asked me, where does the, this term come from? There are several anecdotes One that I'm familiar with, or I like to think as the true one, that during the Manhattan Project, Enrico Fermi was musing, how did it happen that there are so many Hungarian physicists participating in the Manhattan Project? Where did they come from? And Leo Szilard said that, oh, they came from the Mars, and to disguise their origin, they speak Hungarian. There are other versions of this. I like that one. So do I. So it was Teller, and who else uh, are you, do you define as the Martians besides Teller? Chronologically, in order of their year of birth, Theodor von Kármán, Leo Szilard, Eugene Wigner, John von Neumann, and Edward Teller. So those are all very big names in science, very well known. I was interested in all the different ways that Teller was involved in basic science before he got involved in the Manhattan Project, and also his collaborative way of working. So could you describe maybe a couple of the different ways that Teller had influenced basic science before getting involved in the Manhattan Project? Teller had a broad spectrum of his research activities. And you hinted at collaborative efforts. This was very typical of his working. Seldom worked on a research project alone. He liked to work with someone else. And this was also his tragedy after he had been, quote unquote, exiled from the scientific community that he no longer had this possibility of interacting with others. Teller started at the university, actually at the Budapest Technical University, which is today the Budapest University of Technology and Economics, as a student of chemical engineering. He was not the only one among the five Martians who studied chemical engineering, except that he didn't graduate in chemical engineering. Two others who graduated as chemical engineers, and you should be surprised, One was John von Neumann, who is well known for his mathematics, his computer, but he did graduate from chemical engineering. And the other was someone whom we know as a great theoretical physicist, Eugene Wigner. He also had graduated as chemical engineer. Now, why did they go into chemical engineering? One, because being a physicist or a mathematician was not a profession during the first third of the 20th century, not only in Hungary, anywhere. So it was not a job perspective, being a physicist or or a mathematician, maybe just as a teacher or a professor, but chemical engineering 
that was a very secure job. And although these boys might have not thought about this, but their parents did. And the young people at that time listened to their parents. Surprisingly, they still listen to their parents when it comes to what they should study. <laughs> well, they went into chemical engineering, and that is how Teller also started in Budapest. The agreement between his mother and his father was that until he reached the age of 18, he would stay in Budapest and study in Budapest. When he reached 18, he moved. That was after just one semester in Budapest. He moved to Germany. And in Germany, for a while, he continued in chemical engineering, but was shifting more and more toward physics. First in Karlsruhe, then in Munich, and finally he completed his studies at the University of Leipzig under Werner Heisenberg. And that is where he did his doctorate. You see, the borderline between physics and chemistry, physics and physical chemistry, molecular physics and physical chemistry, that's very uncertain. So his dissertation was about the hydrogen molecular ion. Now, this is possibly the simplest chemical entity. It's H2 with a positive charge. That means two protons and one electron. You know, an H2 molecule, which would be neutral, would be two protons and two electrons. This was one electron less, and this is why it was a molecular ion rather than a molecule. But it still be considered physical chemistry or molecular physics. That's where he did his doctoral thesis and defended it. And so he was doing physical chemistry, molecular physics for the next few years. I would say some of his work was purely physical chemistry and not physics, like his participation in studying the mechanism of adsorption. Adsorption is when, say, molecules stick to the surface. That's adsorption, you know, maybe in a somewhat unsophisticated way to explain. You are a physicist, right? Yes. Yes, but not all your listeners will be physicists. No, not all my listeners are physicists or scientists. And I'm not trying to look down your listeners, but I'm trying to... No, no, it's good to explain it. Yeah, absolutely. This direction in his research culminated in an equation which is called the BET equation. This was, by then, he was in the United States. BET means... Brunauer, Emmett, Teller, three participants. And I find this a very important point, this setting up this equation, because it determined absorption, and it had two significance, two points for us. One is that this equation is still being used. So it, it, although it was set up in the 1930s, it is still around or some modifications, but basically it has survived decades and still useful. The other is, I have to go back a little bit to Teller's style. He gave interviews, interviews, but always insisted either the interview would be communicated in full or not at all. I don't think he would have agreed with you to record the podcast which you were going to edit. And actually, I follow his rules, but not in your case and not, not in such obviously, hopefully, very honest place, case. But I just turned down, down two interviews in Budapest because I was not sure that cutting and pasting and editing would result in what I would have liked to communicate. And Teller was very insistent on this. And my wife and I record the long conversation with him in 1996, I think. And our technique was that we would transcribe the interview, send back to the interviewee. We are not journalists, so we, we would let the interviewees change whatever they liked. Teller only corrected the grammar and, and his editor also helped, whom I then got to know her very well, who, who helped him write his memoirs. 
But there was one point which very uncharacteristically Teller asked us to delete from the interview. And I think this is the single time when he did anything like that. And this was in connection with what he said about the BET equation. And this is why I'm bringing this up at this point. He said, when I showed some unfamiliarity with this equation, the details, he said, oh, that's awful. That's terrible, terrible. He liked to use this word, terrible. I can't, probably I can imitate his Hungarian accent. But anyway, he said, this is the one for which I should have been received the Nobel Prize. I should have received the Nobel Prize. And he wanted this to be deleted, this comment from his interview, which we did in the printed version, we omitted this. But I'm telling you this because he's long gone, and I think this is a very interesting point, that this is what he found very interesting, very important, and truly as an important criteria of the Nobel Prize is to make it useful, to have it for the benefit of mankind. And this was really, I mean, for determining surface areas, this equation is used in mining. This is an important tool to prevent explosions, unwanted explosions of the gases in, in the mine. So this equation really served the benefit of, of mankind. He just as well have, might have received the Nobel Prize for it with his two colleagues, of course, Brunard and Emmett. So this is what he wanted to leave out. This was, again, a physical chemistry contribution, and he had others also. When he moved in 1935 to the United States and he went to GWU, George Washington University, at the insistence of George Gamow. Gamow insisted not with Teller, but the leadership of the university that they should invite Teller to be full professor also, because Gamow, a Russian refugee from Soviet Union, insisted that he needed a partner. And apparently Gamov was also one who could create best when he could cooperate with someone else, and that was Teller. And for years, they worked together. Teller liked to get up very late. They went to his office. Gamov already was waiting for him with some ideas, and Teller either disproved or agreed, and then they produced a joint publication. And at that time, Gamow was deep in nuclear physics. And this is how Teller's attention shifted toward nuclear physics. I could elaborate examples from molecular physics and physical chemistry, but wouldn't feel comfortable telling you examples from his nuclear physics. So this is, we can move on. Okay. I think the BET equation is actually a really good example, especially since it was so transformative to the field and people are still using it. So with that collaboration, was it hard for Teller when he went to Los Alamos to kind of be put in a group by himself almost? Again, if you are not hard press, pressed for time, I would go back to his childhood, school years. I'm not hard-pressed for time. He was a very lonely person. He was not much liked by his classmates until he really tried hard and helped his classmates, and gradually he became popular. And he kept staying popular among his colleagues, probably up to the Manhattan Project, Los Alamos. There, something happened. He didn't like to do routine calculations. He wanted to think more about the fusion bomb, the hydrogen bomb, which was not a timely issue at that time. They had to create the atom bomb. The atom bomb was not a challenge in the sense of how to make an atom bomb. But the hydrogen bomb would become a challenge because even after the pre president of the United States had decided to develop the hydrogen bomb, nobody knew exactly how to produce it. So Teller liked to think about this. Also, he may have been heard when he was not appointed head of the theoretical group. So with this almost like a prima donna behavior, 
he was losing some of his popularity, not entirely. Even after the war, when they moved to Chicago, they kept the household, they had lots of guests, people came to stay with, it, with them when they had arrived and couldn't find yet uh, accommodation. He, when he lost entirely his popularity among his colleagues, and that was his testimony at the Oppenheimer hearing, his problems with his colleagues started at Los Alamos. Why do you think he started losing that popularity? Was it this prima donna-ness? Because in the atomic project, you had to do what was necessary to do, and whether you liked it or not. Enrico Fermi was a great scientist, and he didn't mind doing a lot of numerical calculations. So he had helped, but still he had to do some of it himself. Della didn't like doing that. So people thought, well, this is beneath him. In some ways, and also it, it was for the atom bomb project, thinking or working on the hydrogen bomb was a waste of time. It was premature. Actually, Oppenheimer saved the situation at that time. He said, okay, Teller can work alone. And he offered him to spend one hour weekly with him. Oppenheimer did that. Oppenheimer was terribly busy, must have been, but he offered and kept his word. He spent one hour every week from that point on during the Los Alamos project, the atom bomb project, spending with Teller, discussing what Teller wanted to discuss and so on. Was Teller happy with that amount of time and with that arrangement? Well, it was a great privilege because Oppenheimer's time and attention was at premium. And yes, that, that was good. They, they had other crashes because once they were traveling on a train and they were having a conversation and at some point Oppenheimer made a, a very surprising remark, surprising for Teller that hopefully when this will be over, we will get out of their jurisdiction, meaning the authorities, the military and so on. And Teller wasn't thinking in, in such terms that he would have felt uncomfortable being in this system, whereas Oppenheimer apparently did. But of course, Oppenheimer had a very complex character because he, on the one hand, he was thinking this way. On the other hand, he was more accommodating with the military than the rest of the scientists. When the General Grove suggested that the scientists put on a uniform and take scientific, uh, military ranks, he went along with that, but the others protested. So finally, this didn't happen. The scientists remained civilians during the Manhattan Project. So Oppenheimer was accommodating, but was resentful also. So Oppenheimer wanted the Los Alamos to close after the war, but Teller was not in favor of that? Teller didn't see the end of the project at all. Oppenheimer thought that mission accomplished, as many people thought. And Teller knew that was not the end of it, because he knew, already had been thinking about this for years by then, that the hydrogen bomb should be developed. And why did he think, besides it just being a really interesting problem, why did he think the hydrogen bomb needed to be built? Okay, of course it was an interesting problem from a physicist's point of view, but he was afraid of the Soviet hydrogen bomb which most other people, politicians and scientists alike, thought that the Soviet Union would be unable to develop. And Teller thought otherwise. Why? Well, people didn't think, most people didn't think that the Soviet Union would be capable of developing the hydrogen bomb, which was a much more complicated task than the atom bomb, because the Soviet Union had an obsolete infrastructure to start with, and even that obsolete infrastructure was completely destroyed during the war. The Soviet Union suffered terrible losses, not only in manpower, but also in infrastructure. However, Teller knew two things that the others didn't quite realize. One was that a totalitarian, even if it has no proper infrastructure, but choosing a selected problem, he would concentrate all resources and solve it, a totalitarian system. That was one. And the others, I mean, the real Americans didn't have experience with totalitarian systems. 
the other experience Paul Teller had, and most others didn't, he knew excellent Soviet physicists like Lev Londo, with whom he interacted while in Denmark and Germany. And he knew that there were physicists in the Soviet Union who were as capable as they were to work on such a project as the hydrogen bomb. So this was what determined his thinking. And I would like to add something that very few people know, that Leo Szilard, whom everybody thinks was the antagonist to Teller, Leo Szilard was for peaceful coexistence with the Soviet Union. But Leo Szilard was not a fool. He knew that, for example, he, Leo Szilard, wouldn't survive living in the Soviet Union, in a totalitarian system. And he also knew that only a strong America could counterbalance the Soviet Union. So he supported Teller. But very few people know this. Yes, and it has been documented. I, I myself was looking for such proof because this was in a way unexpected and to most people unbelievable. So there was a speech by Leo Szilard in 1954 in Los Angeles, but it was for Brandeis University, which is not in Los Angeles, I know, it is in Massachusetts, but there, there was a circle of friends or some event for Brandeis University where Leo Szilard was invited to give a speech. And he spoke about this, that he supported Teller, and he told a very funny story. It's a szilard story, must have been true, that he mentioned to a government official, Leo Szilard mentioned to a government official that it's a pity that Teller alone advocates the importance of developing the hydrogen bomb in the United States, or one of the very few. And then that o government official warned Szilard, please don't talk about this publicly, because if the Soviets get to know this, that Teller is the one who is advocating the development of the hydrogen bomb, they will do everything to make him impossible. To, they will, this big debate was at the early stage of the McCarthy hysteria. And it could have happened easily that Teller would be painted as a red or something and make him impossible to act. This is a bizarre story, but Szilard found it very important that Teller continue his activities. Now, this speech exists, I mean, the description of this speech exists, but I still didn't think this was proof enough that it did happen, this speech. So I was looking for some additional evidence, and I found it. My wife and I had a, a large interviewing project, private project, completely without any support, interviewing scientists. And one of our interviewees was Matthew Messelson. I don't know if you know the name. He's a, a very famous molecular geneticist, Messelson, at Harvard University, still alive. And when I interviewed him, we recorded a conversation with Messelson. It happened that he was a student at the California Institute of Technology when Szilard came for this visit in Los Angeles, and Messerson was asked to be a chauffeur for Szilard. Szilard didn't drive. I'll come back to this Szilard didn't drive point a little later. So Messerson was present with Szilard, and more than that, Szilard practiced his talk in front of Messerson. So Messerson, this great authority in science, Harvard professor, told me that he could fully support that this is how it happened. This speech did happen. Szilard said all these things, what is in this description of this 1954 Brandeis talk in Los Angeles. And I published this, so it is printed. I think this is a great story.
It is. And that's very surprising from everything that history has kind of written and idolized about Szilard. And we can still idolize him. And I think what he did in this case, you see, you can say many negative things about Teller. One of the negative things people like to say about him that he created this hydrogen bomb. First of all, he didn't create it alone, especially he didn't decide himself. It was President Truman who decided that the United States should develop it. But that the United States did develop the hydrogen bomb, I think it's a very positive feature in our history. When I say our history, I don't mean American history. I'm not an American. In the history of mankind. Because this, in the Soviet Union, while in 1949 the Americans were still debating the question of the hydrogen bomb, whether the United States should develop it or not, in the Soviet Union, Stalin already ordered in 1946 to develop the hydrogen bomb in the Soviet Union. Now, in the United States, among the scientists, this debate was raging on in 1949. Most scientists, and especially the members of the General Advisory Committee of the Atomic Energy Commission, all of them were against developing. There were two differing opinions. Oppenheimer and his colleagues, and this was the majority opinion, said that the United States should show an example not to develop the hydrogen bomb, expecting the Soviet Union to follow it. The dissenting people, that was Fermi and Rabi, Isidore Rabi, they said, the United States should make a pledge not to develop. Of course, these two opinions, setting an example or making a pledge, these are not very different opinions. But both opinions were against developing the hydrogen bomb. So it was a very strong voice. And that is what the scientists advised to the Atomic Energy Commission. Then the head of the atomic, the chairman of the Atomic Energy Commission, the Secretary of State, and the Secretary of Defense or Secretary of War, I don't know exactly what was the designation at that time, in 1949. This was this three-member panel that advised President Truman. And the final decision at the end of January 1950, Truman decided that the hydrogen bomb should be developed. And this was a public announcement. A few months, I think, later, he made a secret order to accelerate the development. So it was not Teller's decision, but he and a few others advocated that it should be important because the Soviet Union, and today we know that this was crucial. At that time, people couldn't know. People could not know. There are people who still hold to the, the opinion that this was warmongering. It wasn't. The scientists refused to participate, then it can't be built. Yes, but the Soviet scientists didn't debate it. They were ordered and they worked on it. Yeah, they didn't have a choice. They didn't have a choice. And I talked with one of the principal idea sources of the Soviet hydrogen bomb, Vitaly Ginzburg, a Nobel laureate. And Ginzburg told me that they didn't think about it. They got this order and they were working on it. And Sakharov also wrote that it was in order to maintain peace, to develop the hydrogen bomb for the Soviet Union. Where does this hatred of the Soviet Union or this fear of the Soviet Union for Teller come from? Like, any idea? I mean, it's hard. People are complex. It's a very, very legitimate question. And I'm very glad that you asked this, because let me be very personal. When we started interviewing Teller, he was very remorse. He, he wasn't willing to speak. He just came out of an illness. He was recuperating. We, we had a conversation prior to this in Hungary, and then the interview was conducted in English. But during this, the beginning, when he was so unfriendly, his wife interrupted him and whispered to him in Hungarian, don't be so unfriendly, because he was unfriendly. I asked him questions, and he gave one word or at most one sentence responses. So it, it didn't work well. And then came up this question about his anti-communism. 
or being anti-Soviet. And there, I didn't wait for response. I told him what I thought was the origin. And that changed the atmosphere of this conversation. From that point on, because he understood that I knew much more than a journalist or a casual interviewer would know. So what was the origin? There are two principal sources. One was that his very good friend, who later became an important professor at MIT, Laszlo Tissa, a physicist, at Teller's recommendation when Tissa could not get a job in Budapest, Tissa went to the Soviet Union, this was in, in the 1930s, to Kharkov, which is Kharkiv in Ukrainian, you know, at, at, at some time Kharkiv was the capital of Ukraine, and there was a very ambitious physics institute. And Landa was there at that time. And Tisa became a graduate student of Landa and earned a second doctorate. Tisa had already earned a PhD. But then in the Soviet Union, he got a second doctorate. To add to this, Landa was one of the greatest theoretical physicists in the 20th century. Now, one of the things that was so unique about him he had a system of, he called it minimum examination in theoretical physics and mathematics. Te or minimum, it was called in Russian, te or minimum. And during his entire life, and of course his life was cut short by an accident, automobile accident, Landau died in 1968, but he stopped his high-level work because of this accident, he stopped doing this kind of work in 1962, and he was born in 1908. He was 54. His entire career, he had 34 people, 34 physicists who had passed this theoretical minimum examination. So, Laszlo Tissa was one of the 34 who passed this examination, and the only foreigner ever to have passed this examination. So this is, I'm just characterizing the caliber of Laszlo Tissa as a scientist. When Landau suddenly left Kharkov, Kharkiv, and went back to Leningrad, as it was called then, and people started disappearing at this physics institute in Kharkov because of this terrible terror of Stalin, in the middle of the 1930s, Tissa left, came back to Hungary, and told Teller about all these terrible things, what was going on in the Soviet Union. This was one source for Teller to learn about the nature of the Soviet system. And the other source happened a few years later, 1942, when a book by another Hungarian SKP, Arthur Köstler, Darkness at Noon. This is one of the greatest political novels of the 20th century. He describes these staged political trials in the Soviet Union. And Teller read this book and he knew Köstler. You know, Köstler could also be considered a Martian, but he was not a scientist, so we don't include him in, into this five. But, I mean, by his caliber as a, as a journalist and as, a, as an author, so Kessler described this for the first time, these conditions in the Soviet Union, these staged political trials. And these two factors made Teller politically what he became, an anti-communist and anti-Soviet person. And I may add that Teller was not so much opposed to the Soviet Union ideologically rather political, for practical purposes. He recognized the imperialistic intentions of the Soviet Union, and he wanted to defend the United States and the free world from it. So what did you say? You don't have to share, I'm just asking. What did you say so that he understood that you knew? What did I say? I told him that I knew about these two sources of his anti-communism. And this was very important for him, because 
most people, and you can read about this, thought that Teller became anti-communist because he was a survivor of the Hungarian communist system in 1919. And this is absolutely wrong, because at that time he was 11 years old, completely away from politics, and he, together with his family, left Budapest because of, of this communist dictatorship. So he hardly experienced anything, but even if he did at the age of 11, this was nothing to do with it. So it's, it's such a mistaken approach to ascribe his anti-communist to such a personal experience. No, these were the two sources. And I told him that I knew about this, and this changed the atmosphere of, of our conversation and became this interview became one of the most memorable in my entire practice, and I did a lot of interviews. That explains a lot more about Teller and kind of where his motivations are. And also, I mean, did he then view kind of the people who were accused of communism in the U.S. almost as kind of a naive view of communism, that the people here in the U.S. were viewing communism as almost an idealized system that he knew was not the way it was? What I can say is the following. When people were accused of being communist or sympathizing with communists, and this prevented them to be employed by defense projects, he disagreed with that. He considered the expertise, the scientific level of the people to be decisive and not where they stood ideologically. And when Stephen Brunauer, who used to be Istvan Brunauer, you remember the brunauer emmet teller equation, that Brunauer, he was an excellent chemist. And during the war, the Second World War, he became a Navy officer and he was responsible for involving important scientists into the war project, including Albert Einstein. When Brunner was accused by McCarthy, Brunner and also his wife, who worked for the State Department, they were accused of being sympathetic to communism or communists or whatever it was, these McCarthy-like accusations. Teller defended Brunner and went further than defending Brunner. He said that such accusations and such hysteria will hurt the national security because it will prevent people participating in defense projects, even trying to participate because of apprehension of becoming victims of McCarthyism or, or accused of, of such accusations. And this is what he put into writing and and it became public knowledge. So how does that gel or how does that fit with speaking out against Oppenheimer? I mean, I recognize people are very complex. I mean, I've I, after reading your book, I, I was naive, but Teller is very complex as well. But how can he, on one hand, say that about someone in the McCarthy hearings and then speak against Oppenheimer in his trial? At this point, I must be subjective. I mean, what I'm going to say now is I cannot support the documents, something I will be able, and that I'll tell you. I think there were two sources of his antagonism in case of Oppenheimer. One was a personal antagonism, which is hard to explain. But, you know, personal feelings play a role, whether we like to acknowledge this or not. But objectively, Teller saw in Oppenheimer someone who was trying to sabotage his efforts to advocate the development of the hydrogen bomb. And Oppenheimer was a very forceful and a very important factor in this. And this Teller could never forgive. Let's go to his testimony at the Oppenheimer hearing. Most people now agree that 
Oppenheimer's fate had been decided already when Teller gave his testimony. You know that too. I mean, his fate was sealed before he even stepped in that room. But still, Teller's testimony was very important, not for Oppenheimer, but for Teller. His testimony consisted of two parts, and he was a very clever person. And this is how people remembered exactly what he said. Okay, I'm not, I will not be able to remember exactly what he said, but he said the following. First, he said, Oppenheimer is loyal to the United States. This was a very forceful statement. Also, this statement created the idea that Teller is, if not necessary, favoring Oppenheimer, at least his objective. He said, Oppenheimer is loyal. But the next sentence said, he is so complex that I would not trust him the secrets of the country for national security. How can both of those be true, though? Oh, yes, very easily. Because you are loyal, and then you have a lot of secrets, and unknowingly you are giving out these secrets because, because you think this is my friend or this is another loyal person. You know, if you have a secret and you mustn't speak about this, then you must keep it regardless whether you like the other person or not. So Teller said, Oppenheimer is so complex, I wouldn't trust him with, with secrets. So the security clearance should not be prolonged. That was even more powerful because of the first part said that, oh, he's very loyal. If you read Teller's memoirs, he writes about it that he went into the Oppenheimer hearing with the intention of defending Oppenheimer. But Due to what he had heard at that hearing, like that Oppenheimer concocted stories about his pupils just to please the, the military, he lied, he told them stories which were not true and so on. This changed Teller's mind, Teller said. Now, here I can be factual that this was not true. Why can I say that? Because my wife and I researched the Hoover archives, and we found FBI hearing of Teller years before that, years before the Oppenheimer hearing, where Teller said that he would do almost anything to prevent Oppenheimer to stay in leadership position or stay in a position where he can make decisions. And so. so he had to go into the hearing with the intention of denying security clearance or the, the continuation of security clearance because Oppenheimer had security clearance that was being terminated. And this is this says something about Teller's honesty. I mean his goals were commendable but he the means he was trying to reach them sometimes were terrible. And I think how he remembers it in his memoirs says that he's a little sorry about what he did. When I was reading his memoirs, I felt he is so self-tormenting the way he is describing it. And the worst is how he describes his thoughts to Maria Göppert Meyer, with whom he had had a long set of letters exchanged, and he begged her to destroy his letters. She didn't, and this is how he also researched those letters in the Hoover archives. The Hoover archives have a copy of all those letters. The originals are stored somewhere else in California. And at one point, Teller writes, I think I'm just developing my backbone. I might have not had a backbone before. And I'm not even sure if it, if it is developing in the right direction. This is tremendously hard to read. How could he torment himself? And no wonder he wanted her to destroy these letters. But these letters exist. And so Teller had at least two persona. One for the public, this self-assured, aggressive persona. And the other persona was this doubtful, self-tormenting, weak, hesitant, always looking for the authority for approval, 
and so on. Wow. I mean, I'm glad she didn't destroy those letters because it gives such an insight of what he was. This is historically important. We'll have a, a paper about this in the next issue of the Bulletin of the History of Chemistry or something like that. Of The American Chemical Society has a journal. Was he surprised the way that the community responded to his testimony and the kind of the fallout of it, of being kind of rejected by? Yes, I'm sure that he must have been surprised at the beginning and then eventually got used to it. The why I'm saying that he must have been surprised, because the next time after the testimony, he went to Los Alamos and he stretched out his hand, people didn't take it. And he had to withdraw his hand. And that he offered the handshake shows that he didn't expect this reaction. And if we can make a big jump about handshaking, let me say, this was one handshake episode. The next handshake episode that I would like to mention is at the Oppenheimer hearing, when he completed his testimony on leaving the room, he shook Oppenheimer's hand, which was, to me, humanly... And Oppenheimer shook his hand. Yeah, Oppenheimer accepted. Oppenheimer was a gentleman. Not in everything, and not always, but in this situation. The next episode I want to mention is the Oppenheimer film, when Oppenheimer receives the Fermi Award and then Teller wants to shake his wife's hand and his wife refuses. This didn't happen. It didn't. It didn't happen. It was the film, the way of the film concentrated things. It came out very well, but factually this didn't happen. But it is all right. The film, you know, this is artistic freedom. It is all right. So I'm not mentioning this as a criticism of the film. I'm just mentioning this because it is part of this story. And the last episode I want to mention to you is when in 1987, there was a White House reception honoring Gorbachev visiting Washington. And Reagan, President Reagan was introducing Teller to Gorbachev. And he said, this is Professor Teller, Dr. Teller. I don't know. And Teller stretch out his hand. He wanted to shake Gorbachev's hand, and Gorbachev kept his arm rigidly at his body. So Reagan thought that Gorbachev didn't hear, repeated, this is the famous Dr. Teller, and Gorbachev wouldn't accept Teller's outstretched hand. And Teller walked away, not with a sorrow, but proudly that the president of the Soviet Union found him so important that he was willing to provide this terrible behavior to express that he found Teller so important. Wow, that is an interpretation, yeah. But the problem is that this probably didn't take place, this whole episode. You see, about this reception, I read whatever I could in the press. And the descriptions are so detailed about every piece of women's dresses, every drink, everything, and not a mention of this episode, which must have been the, one of the highlights of the re reception. I wrote a letter to Secretary Schultz, who was no longer at that time the Secretary of State, but he was there, and he didn't seem to remember any such thing. So I don't think this happened. I think it happened only in Teller's imagination because this handshake business must have been so much on his mind. I'm not saying that he lied necessarily. I think that this is how he imagined it. His memoirs contains such stories that he must have imagined but did not happen. Well, memory is a really tricky thing. Did Teller keep in touch and remain friends with the other Martians since they had a similar background? Sometimes people say that these Martians were networking in, the, in today's sense. I don't think so, but they, they had interactions. Yes, they had interactions. I had already mentioned von Karman and von Neumann, that von Karman involved von Neumann in 
the in advising the U.S. Air Force, for example, Tyler and Szilard had public debates on television and very entertaining debates, like one of them suggested that they shake hands, again, a handshake, shake hands before the, the debate becomes very violent or something. So they shook each other's hands at the beginning, lest they might not be able to do so later. They had debates, but they behaved civilly, like Teller gave some of his time to Szilard when he felt that Szilard couldn't finish what he wanted to say and so on. And of course, they had opposing views about nuclear testing, about peaceful coexistence with the Soviet Union and, and so on. Now, Wigner and Szilard were also good friends, but they were not intimate friends. In English, you don't have this more polite and less polite form of speech. But in German, there is. In Russian, there is. In Hungarian, there is. So they didn't use the, this familiar way of addressing each other, and they didn't call each other by their first names in their correspondence. Very often, they just used their last names. So it, the, the interactions were not intimate. Yes, they were friends with some limitations. And people agree that von Neumann might have not had friends, you know, real friends, because he kept people at a distance. And I think von Karman too. I think probably all of them. Teller might have wanted to have close friends, but somehow he might have not been able to. I don't know. They interacted, but they were not friends in this noble sense of the word. So you think Teller was lonely? Yes. That's sad. And that explains also his correspondence with Maria Gürtet Meyer. His loneliness shines through those letters. And she seems to be the only person that he thought was a friend or a confidant in some I way. I would call it a soulmate rather than anything else. Which apparently his wife wasn't. It was a very good marriage, but apparently they were not really soulmates. Because Teller seems to have needed another person. You have definitely changed the way I think about Teller. He definitely seems much more like a person now. This is how we end our paper for this bulletin that I mentioned to you, that why do we write so much about this inner person of Teller? Because we realize that even people who are so important for history, they are also human beings. They have their weaknesses. They are just humans. And I think it's probably good if we realize and recognize that. Thank you for listening, and thanks to Espan for speaking to me about Edward Teller and the other Martians. I hope you enjoyed this podcast. If you did, please rate or review on the podcast app you're listening to or tell a friend to listen. Until next time, I'm Shelley Lesher, and this has been My Nuclear Life. <laughs>